Hey guys, uh, welcome to the Dynamic Duo. I'm Franz. I'm Kevin. Welcome home, everybody. It's been a while since we've been here, but guess what? We're back. We're back, and we're back with a review of uh, Spider-Man. What, what is it? Far From Home? Far Homecoming? From Home. Far From Home. Far From Home. <laughs> I always get the titles confused. And we just watched the movie, Kevin. And, um, and we're going to do a, a non-spoiler review. And then maybe if you'd like, we could do a, a spoiler review afterwards. But let's start with the non-spoiler review and get, give our impressions. And uh, let me start, if I may, with the admission that I don't know that I'm qualified, not qualified, but if it's right for me to critique this movie. Um, the reason I say that is because, you know, I am an admittedly purist, old school type of type of person. And the question that comes into play is whether or not I can objectively, as objectively as possible, critique this movie without letting my influences and my desires and my wishes and my likes come into play. It's very difficult for me to, to do that. So let me try um, as, as best I can with the caveat to the audience that I am admitting that I may be biased. And I'll explain that bias a little bit. Uh, objectively, what I saw, Kevin, was the audience reaction. When I watch these movies, you know, uh, especially when we're going to discuss them on the show, I watch them with an eye, not just of what's going on on the screen, but how is the audience reacting to it? And I have to say that I got a positive vibe from the audience. I got laughter when it was supposed I'm to sorry, be. I'm sorry, what was your name again? Dr. Otto Octavius. <laughs> Wait, no, seriously, what's your actual name? Yeah, I've got, you know, like uh, one, one lady was like, <gasps> you know, shocked throughout the whole thing. Um, I got a, a, a smidgen of, of applause at, at the end. And so, it, and, and also as we were walking into the movie theater, there was a group that had left and they were talking very positively about the movie. So it seems like it's a movie that's an extremely enjoyable movie to go see. So right then and there, you should go see this movie because it seems as though audience are liking it. Uh, the second um, thing that I'd say objectively is that it's a good movie. It's a good movie in the sense of it's done well. Um, good directing, good, good um, cinematography, good action, good um, special effects, nothing really lacking. Is it great? I don't think so, but it's good. It's a fine, fine line between delivering a good scene and delivering a bad scene. It's a very, very fine line. And I don't think there were any bad scenes in that movie. And I think it was entertaining enough and big enough and, and certainly you know, um, explosive enough to bring a lot of joy to a lot of people. Uh, last thing that I'm going to say is the, the last third of the movie made it much more enjoyable to me. I thought it kind of brought it home, the action sequences, it kind of delivered and it was fun and it was good. Having said all that, and this is where I'm admitting to my bias, I, as a purist, for me, Kevin, first two thirds of the movie was so anti what I know of the character that just wasn't, I couldn't connect. I just, it just kept bothering me. I just couldn't get past those things. It just, it's aggressively anti Stanley Spider-Man. Now, one thing that I will admit, and it's one thing that I appreciate is that the movie made a point to say, this is not Stanley Spider-Man. This is a, an alternate version of Stanley Spider-Man. They made a point to make that clear. And so in the sense, I'm able to accept it a little bit more knowing that it's not that you're ruining Stanley Spider-Man, it's just that you're reinventing him. I've accepted it with Batman with the Dark Knight, which I think is a great movie. Um, Batman Begins also, it's not Batman, but it's a version, it's an alternate version of, of Batman. And I could appreciate it. Um, the same thing is happening with Matt Reeves' Batman. It seems as though it's an alternate universe Batman. It's not the Batman that I, that I come to know and love. And the movie made it very, very clear that this is not Spider-Man, this is a Spider-Man. Having said that, whereas I like Nolan's Batman, the question becomes, do I like Tom Holland's? And, and 
perhaps because Spider-Man is my favorite character, perhaps because I'm that connected to the character. My answer is I don't like Tom Holland Spider-Man. I know that a lot of people love him and I'm not saying that you shouldn't or you should. This is not a critique. This is really just my personal taste and opinion. I think he does a fine job as an actor, but it just, I don't like that Spider-Man. I don't like the wide-eyed, young, trying to figure out Spider-Man. I like the more confident um, Spider-Man, even though I know people will say, oh, wait a second, Spider-Man is supposed to be a nerd, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's not quite what you think. But anyway, having said all that, um, the movie was good to me. It was all right. It was, yeah, you know, I, I, it was good. What did you think? First of all, thank you. Okay. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, and this plays into what I'm about to say. Have you ever had a plate full of food, <laughs> built up the food on the plate, and then after sitting down to have a fantastic meal or snack or whatever you're doing, you realize you can't eat it all? Mm. To yes. me, that's what Far From Home was. Like you, I am absolutely a traditionalist and a purist. I liked a lot of the movie. But as I told you, when we sat through it, I liked it in spades and in spots. The action for a lot of it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I love the way that a lot of it was shot. Uh, cinematography wise, lighting wise, and what have you, you know, on a technical level, the folks that are putting these things together, in my opinion, they're nailing it for the most part. Okay. But my problem, even though like yourself, I understood that this was not the traditional, you know, Spider-Man from when the character was created. And I have nothing against that. I mean, my goodness, we've had uh, over the years, what, almost six or seven Spider-Man movies now, if not more. Uh, I have nothing against these reinterpretations of the character, but my problem is you can reinterpret something so much and want so badly to have it reinterpreted for another audience or a new audience or a new generation that you strip away the prime things that make the character or characters who they are, what they are, and what they represent to whether uh, to anything that you're dealing with, whether it's a comic book movie, whether it's um, an episode of Star Trek or, uh, or a Star Wars film or whatever it happens to be, you can strip away so much of it that you can kill it. And one of the things you pointed out, you know, visually, and, and technologically, the film, as I said, as you've said, it looked fantastic. But for me, the story falls apart. And the story falls apart because they're trying so hard to reinvent Spider-Man. They're trying so hard to reinterpret Spider-Man for this generation. Some of that works. In my opinion, a lot of it didn't. It, it, the big thing for this movie was one of the problems that I had when the conversation came up of, you know, all these other characters are going to come back. Meaning, you know, some of the villains, the audience now knows I'm not going to give anything away. And the fact that, you know, you were supposed to have gotten the other Spider-Man characters from different points. By itself, that was fine. But to me, the execution began to as you said, 
during the elements of the movie where that was introduced, it began to fall apart. Like yourself, I kind of give the movie a marginal thumbs up because of the way that they handled the conclusion. Prior to that, I have to be honest to you, the audience, and anybody else that follows us, or even for people who don't and might want to start. I was disappointed by what I was seeing up until that crescendo point where they kind of, or I, I shouldn't say crescendo, but the, the point sorry. where they grabbed the audience and finally said, okay, you all have been waiting a year and a half, two years, whatever the timeline has been for this movie. We're going to give it to you now. But it was like all of the previous material that they were dealing with within the crux of the story, I was just kind of sitting there bored, to be honest with you. It didn't do anything for me. And that part I of it has nothing to do with me being a purist. I just think writing-wise, they dropped the ball. I, I couldn't, I, forgive me for jumping in, but I couldn't agree with you more. And you said it well. And, and, and you, you're, you know, you've said so many things and I wanted, I always like to try to listen and not think about what I'm going to say, but that means that sometimes I lose some of the things that I want to say. But, but um, you've said so many important things. One thing that I'm going to address really quickly, and it's very important because we, we both have said it, that they delivered from a special effects point of view and they, you know, the action sequences were good. Let me make a, a very interesting point, and I think I, I think you'll agree with me. However good this delivery was, I don't think it was better than what was delivered in Spider-Man 2 almost 20 years ago. In fact, I, I will argue that, that what I saw in Spider-Man 2 was better uh, for, from a special effects and delivery point of view. I will argue that I'm not saying that it is, I'm saying that I'm, I would be ready to argue it. So in other words, it wasn't that far beyond what was happening 20 years ago. Um, what, you made a very, very, very good point. Uh, and, and, and it's like the last third of the movie where the climax starts to take place, that's kind of what brought you back within the movie. And to explain to the audience what we mean without giving spoilers is, if you look at a movie like, let's say Spider-Man 2, or Black Widow, or, 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 or Winter Soldier. What you find is that you have a linear story that builds, and the connections are made, and things that are happening within the beginning of the story are setting up something for the future. I meet you, I, I get to know you, we develop a relationship, there's distrust, and then you betray me. And that betrayal becomes impactful because of every, the history that we've had together. What was lacking in this movie for me was that the beginning of the movie, the first two thirds of the movie was just a hodgepodge. It wasn't a linear story. It was a bunch of things just happening that weren't necessarily connected to one another. And it wasn't building up to a crescendo. The crescendo that we're talking about, there was no build up to it. It just happened. Uh, there was no, there was no uh, you know, relationship connection we don't want to give a spoiler, but something dramatic happens, but there was no foundation for that, for that thing to happen. There was no buildup for that thing to happen. And when I say buildup, I mean, make me care about the character so that when, ex, you know, develop the relationship of the character so that when something significant happens, I'm that much more connected to it. Whereas if the character is just another character and then something significant happens to them, then, you're like, oh, oh, that's interesting. And I'm supposed to know the history. I'm supposed to just kind of take for granted what the history is and therefore care. I think it works because people do know the history and I know the history and therefore I did understand the impact of that action. But I felt that it was very disconnected. And until it happened, the movie didn't have any real gravitas to it. It just was hodgepodgey. Things are happening, you know, multiverse, blah, 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 blah. And it, 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 the emotion, they tried. It is in there. It's there. And, and someone who disagrees with us will say, well, it's there in this particular scene. And I agree with that. It is there. I just don't think that it was there. It was delivered in a 
connective and powerful enough way. I don't know, which I'm trying to be cryptic. I don't know if that made any sense uh, to you, Kevin. It, it, it did, and it does. Uh, and allow me to add to what you're saying um, by stating this. Although Marvel, over the last 10 years plus, has been able to hit home runs for the most part, with their cinematic presentations. And DC had been able to do it from years ago. I'm not going to actually say that DC was able to do it now or has been able to do it for the, the audience of today because they've missed so many. They've had a few hits, but a lot of them have simply dragged the bottom. And I hate to say this as much as I love Marvel, but you also know that I love DC. They're both beginning to suffer from the same problem. They're creating set pieces that you can tell have come from brainstorming sessions where someone sitting you know, at a conference table, he said, oh, we got to have this, 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 and this. Okay? Great. Let's do it. We got the special effects. We got the money. We got the people. Let's set that up. Let's do that. Here's the problem. You have no story. So a special effect and an action scene, as beautiful as you can make it, is fantastic. But a special effect and a set piece is nothing if you don't have story. And Marvel, in spite of their popularity, and DC have both gotten into this thing of all we need to do, because these are pre-existing universes or pre-existing situations, all we have to do is scene one scene two scene five and scene 17 and we've got a movie no 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 you don't you have a bunch of set pieces that you've given to an editor and allowed somebody who's directing that has said there's your movie let, let me take a moment to applaud you bro <laughs> this, this deserves an <laughs> Applause. That deserves an applause because you you absolutely nailed it. That is absolutely true. And that's exactly what we've been trying to say. And you've said it beautifully. You know, people are going to disagree with us. They're going to think that we're haters. And 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 because this movie is going to be loved. As I've as, as we've said before, the outcome of how the audience is supposed to feel about the movie is predetermined. And this is a movie that's supposed to be loved, and therefore people are loving it. Um, and because they're loving it, prior to seeing it, they'll disagree with anyone who doesn't love it just as much as they do. Until 20 years later when they realize that, oh, wait a second, it wasn't as good as we said. But what, what you just said is precisely that. It was a movie by committee. What was the difference between Spider-Man 1, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man 3? Spider-Man 1 and 2 was a labor of love from a fan who loved the character and wanted to bring the character to life. And he did that. Spider-Man 3 was a studio influence by committee. We need to do X, Y, and Z. And while it was the same director and it was the same actors, and while the special effects were arguably better in the sense of bigger, while the budget was bigger, um, Spider-Man 3 it, it, it doesn't even belong in the trilogy. It's not even good enough to be mentioned along with the trilogy because it was set pieces. And I would absolutely agree with you that that's what I saw in this movie. It was a bunch of set piece situation that didn't have a linear story. Let's talk about, since we cannot talk spoilers, let's talk about what we mean. Spider-Man 3 had a crescendo and a climax too. Spider-Man 3 had moments of, oh, revel. 
the end when he's finding Sandman and and uh, and uh, the Green Goblin becomes his friend and 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 Venom is you know there were moments of of of, of emotional uh, connections too, but it wasn't connected. It wasn't connected to the beginning to what was happening in the beginning, and so it it set pieces. Action sequence is fantastic, but it's not connected as opposed to and and I hate to bring it up but as opposed to what you see for example in the internals the reason i love that movie as much as i do is because by the time the the, the ending fight comes along my god you you every, every blow matters because there's a connection to every blow this is my friend going against my feelings because it was set up throughout the beginning same thing with spider-man 2 by the time spider-man is fighting doc ock there's a development of the character, his relationship with Doc Ock, you know, his relationship with Norman Osborn, and so on and so forth. This movie lacked that. It was there. It's officially technically there, but as you've said, it's there in set pieces and committee set pieces rather than a linear um, connective piece. And well said, well said. I'm just afraid before all is said and done for all of what either studio has done meaning warner brothers for the most part and uh uh disney and marvel combined now that this may be the way that they're going to go from here on out and if it is it means the downfall of both sides i'm hoping not and i pray not um i'm hoping that the the next phase of marvel um I, I hope whoever handles the Fantastic Four understands the importance of that linear relationship. I, I just pray that they do. I well, hope that the next... I'm sorry? Uh, forgive me for cutting you off. Are you aware that the person who's going to direct the Fantastic Four is the gentleman who just did Spider-Man? Oh, you're kidding. No way. They chose no. him already? He's already under contract and they're already getting started. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, they haven't, <coughs> pardon me. They haven't said anything about casting yet or anything, but I do know that they're having early, uh, early uh, con uh, concept meetings and pre-production meetings and he's already in the director's chair. I, I, and forgive me, I cannot remember the gentleman's name, but he will be directing the Fantastic Four. So that's interesting because, uh, first of all, it, he would not have been my choice. You know, my choice would have been the, the lady who did uh, um, Zoe, um, um, who did the Eternals. Yeah. Um, but he, look, he's a good enough director to deliver a scene. Um, I think with the right script and the right actors and the right explanation from the producers, he's a good enough director to deliver the scene. He wouldn't have been my choice, but he's a good enough director to deliver the scene. Now it's up to the producer to say to him, this is what we want you to deliver. You know, I don't know if he's connected to the Fantastic Four. I don't know if he's a fan. I don't know if he knows the, you know, the, the, the characters, but it, it's up to whoever's producing that movie to say, this is what we want if he is not. And mm -hmm. as such, I think, listen, he could deliver a scene. You know, as I said earlier, delivering a scene is a very, very tricky thing. And someone walking into a room and saying hello could either be done in a very horrible, cheesy, bad acting, bad directing way, or done in a way that's like, wow, the best scene ever. You know, Quentin Tarantino could have two people sitting across from each other talking, and somehow that's like crazy compelling as opposed to not. And, and so he's good enough to technically deliver a scene. Whether or not the story, the lineage, and all that other stuff is gonna be there. Oh, I, I, I hope it is, man. I really, I really truly hope it is. Um, yeah. I truly hope that it is. But so that's what I'm saying. I hope that, I hope, I hope that the next, you know, you've got Fantastic Four, you've got the X-Men. And those are two huge franchises that can and should be delivered. And they better be because I got a bet with my brother that, <laughs> that, that, um, 
that um, not that they're going to be good, but that you know people are going to be interested in it. And so far, I'm by the way, I'm winning the bet because there's a huge interest in Spider-Man: Homecoming. So whether it's good or bad, people are all over it. So, so I'm I'm betting that by the time the X-Men come out, it's going to be a huge uh, topic of discussion. The first time we see Wolverine, are you kidding me? The first time we see you know Mr. Fantastic and his outfit, you know those kinds of things. And so. I don't know what else we can say about this. Um, definitely, I say it's worth seeing. I say that certainly if you're not as connected to the history of the character as we are, it, it, it's clearly an enjoyable movie because people are enjoying it. Um, so check it out and, and think for yourself and, and what, what, what you think. I feel the same way. Go check it out for yourself. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we we could sit here for the next six hours tearing this thing apart and putting it back together again for you. But at the end of the day, it's up to everybody's interpretations and what's acceptable for them within the world of Spider-Man. So even with what we're saying, judge for yourself. Agreed. 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 All right, guys. I hope, uh, if you like hit the like button subscribe let us know what you think let us know if you agree or disagree and uh, help us build the channel i'll uh, see you later thank you